This is problem 1120, it's on page 644. A commercial refrigerator with R134A as the working fluid is used to keep the refrigerated space at negative 30 degrees Celsius by rejecting its waste heat to cooling water that enters the condenser at 18 degrees Celsius at a rate of a quarter kilogram per second and leaves at 26 degrees Celsius. The refrigerant enters the condenser at 1.2 megapascal, 65 degrees Celsius, and leaves at 42 degrees Celsius. The inlet state of the compressor is 60 kilopascals at negative 34 degrees Celsius, and the compressor is estimated to gain a net heat of 450 watts from the surroundings. Determine A, the quality of the refrigerant at the evaporator inlet, B, the refrigeration load, C, the coefficient of performance of the refrigerator, and D, the theoretical maximum refrigeration load for the same power input to the compressor. So we've got some information about the system as it actually is, and we're supposed to compare it to a uh, theoretical system. So I'm going to write down the thing as I've got on my notes. We'll start there. I, I think I'll begin, though, with, uh, well, let's make a table. Uh, I'll tell you what, let's, let's start with a diagram to indicate the system. So this will be our uh, condenser where we have the flow of waste thermal heat coming out of it, assuming this, I think this was a refrigeration application. Yeah, commercial refrigeration. So it's not a heat pump. So this is not the flow we care about, but it's a byproduct of the fact that we're pulling thermal energy out of something. I'm going to call this state 2, which is the exit of the compressor, so flows actually uh, counterclockwise. So here's our compressor, we'll just indicate that with a piston, and um, there's flow, let's see, call this state 1, flow into the compressor. Now, here's the whole point in having the refrigeration system in the first place. We want to put heat or pump heat out of a system. So Q dot L is our goal, and the standard way to uh, complete this is with an expansion valve or a throttling device of some sort where we drop the pressure. So there's a, there's a low pressure side here and a high pressure side, and of course the compressor brings the refrigerant up to the high pressure side, and the valve dumps the pressure the low pressure side. So there are state numbers, one, two, three, and four, and what I like to do in a lot of these cycle problems is make a table. You can do this in Excel, you can write it on a piece of paper, however you want to do it. But uh, I like to note what the various uh, states are, one, two, three, and four. I'll just put a line in here to separate it so I can keep everything straight. And then the various variables of interest in the various states. So pressure is an interesting one that's useful. Uh, let's see, temperature in degrees Celsius is a useful one. Uh, what else might be useful? Enthalpy is always interesting. So kilojoules per kilogram, in other words, specific uh, enthalpy. And then what about if we include entropy for the time being? Why not? Kilojoules per kilogram per Kelvin. And if we need more, I can expand this table later. It's not in Excel, it's on a piece of, well, it's on the whiteboard. Now, they told us a few things. I want to jot them down since I'm sort of on the given side of the problem. Uh, the mass flow rate of the cooling water. Now, there's a difference between the mass flow rate of the cooling water versus the mass flow rate of the uh, refrigerant because the cooling water is going to occur here. It's what's going to pick up this Q dot H. Um, so this, uh, the cooling water is flowing at a quarter kilogram per second. And uh, what else did they tell us? They told us that the temperature change of the cooling water was uh, 26 degrees minus 18 degrees equals 8 degrees Celsius. So the, the cooling water just increases its temperature by 8 degrees Celsius, and that's all I really need to know, at least for this analysis. Now they gave us one more piece of information. They said, let's see, that, where is it? The compressor is estimated to gain a net heat of 450 watts from the surroundings. So not only is there work flowing in here, but there's also, I don't know how to draw it, I guess I'll put it here. There's also heat added by, to the compressor because the compressor is just in a warm environment. So I'm gonna call this Q dot N 450 watts. Okay. 
Now, obviously, there's more work being put in. This is not work. This is heat. This is just the compressor, I guess, is sitting in a warm environment. It absorbs a certain amount of energy as it's compressing the, um, uh, the, the uh, refrigerant. I, I don't know. It doesn't matter. They've just told us that specification. Let's see if we've missed anything else. I think I've got everything. Oh, they've given us some information about the refrigerant itself, but I'm going to put that into the table. Let me read it and we'll figure out where it goes. The refrigerated space is at negative 30 degrees Celsius. But notice that they say the inlet state of the compressor is 60 kilopascals negative 34 degrees. So that's the inlet right here. So while the refrigerated space is at negative 30 degrees, the refrigerant has to be at a lower temperature. And apparently that temperature is negative 34 degrees. So the inlet state to the compressor is state 1. So in state 1, the uh, pressure is 60 kilopascals temperature negative 34 degrees Celsius. I really like the table layout because it helps me keep everything straight. And then they also gave us some more information. Uh, let's see, 1.2 kilopascals. This is um, enters the condenser at 1.2 kilopascals, 65 degrees Celsius, and then leaves that condenser at 42 degrees Celsius. So we can put all that information up here because here's the entrance to the condenser and the exit from the condenser. The exit 3 was uh, 42 degrees. The entrance, the refrigerant came in at 65 degrees. And that's at a pressure of 1.2 megapascals, or in other words, 1,200 kilopascals. Now, you might look at this and say, well, wait a second. I know a little bit about refrigerate, refrigeration systems. And isn't there a saturated mixture here in the condenser and in the, I'm sorry, in the evaporator and in the condenser? Well, usually the exit of the uh, compressor generates a refrigerant that is at uh, superheated, right? So it's, it's got a higher temperature and pressure. It's not close to uh, saturation. So it's not really a surprise to see a change in temperature, even though probably the bulk of this heat flow is from the uh, uh, you know, condensing of the refrigerant. So that's the uh, information that we're given, and we were told to find a bunch of things. But basically, the things we have to find, I'll go ahead and list them here, I guess. Uh, this is the given stuff, but up here I'll put the find stuff. And that is the quality in state four, which would be the quality uh, right before the uh, evaporator, or in other words, after the throttling valve. We're supposed to find the uh, heat transfer rate that this refrigerator is pumping out. Um, and obviously, that's pretty straightforward. Uh, the coefficient of performance of the refrigeration unit and Q.L. max. In other words, we've been given enough information about this system that we can tell it's it may or may not be ideal. Okay, so what we'd like to do is say, well, what's what's the best we could ever do? So let's move forward and see what happens. My usual approach is to solve for all of the um, states and fill out this table and then answer any questions. But because they gave us this cooling water, really this heat flow here, this Q.H, the, the condenser here is a heat exchanger that is taking the hot refrigerant and cooling it down with cooling water. So we can actually calculate this heat flow pretty simply from the information that was given to the water. It would be the mass flow rate of the cooling water. Of course, what I'm really doing is just an energy balance around the cooling water side, which is not shown here. But I guess I could show it. It'd probably, account, be a, probably be a counter current flow type of heat exchanger. And I'll maybe use some human factors here. Okay. And maybe colors together. I don't know if we'll get a decent purple out of that, but whatever. So the idea is that the cooling water comes in cold and will leave, well, cold at 18 degrees, and will leave at 26 degrees. So it increases its temperature by 8 degrees. So the cooling water is not changing phase. It's just got a sensible change, a change in temperature. So we can calculate that by the mass flow of the cooling water multiplied by the heat capacity of the cooling water and the temperature change of the cooling water. You can't use an equation like this on the refrigerant side in either the evaporator or condenser because there's a phase change there. This only takes care of the temperature change piece. Okay? You have to use the latent heat of vaporization if you want to talk about a phase change. But the water 
that's doing the cooling of the refrigerant is not changing phase, so this equation is adequate. So we'll go ahead and plug in the numbers. There's a quarter kilogram per second. If you look up the heat capacity of water, it's about 4.18 kilojoules per kilogram per Kelvin, or per degree Celsius, it doesn't really matter. And we've got a temperature change of 8 degrees Celsius. So there's the temperature change of the cooling water. Now the Kelvin and Celsius can cross off because we're just talking about temperature changes. And of course the kilograms are gone as well. We'll have kilojoules per second, which comes out as uh, kilowatts. Uh, so 8.36 kilojoules per second, or in other words, 8.36 kilowatts is the heat flow rate coming out of this thing. But again, that's not really what I care about. What I care about is how quickly are we removing heat from the refrigerated system. In order to answer that question, I'll have to find out more information about the rest of the states. So let's do that. What do we know? Well, we know uh, all the information we really need about state one and about state two. They were very kind to us. They gave us uh, everything. So. The only thing we don't have are things like enthalpies and entropies. So we can solve them. If we look at uh, state two, I guess I'll start here. I'll quarter off a little space. So for state two, we know the pressure and we know the temperature. So all we have to do is look up anything we want. For example, the enthalpy in state two. So what you have to do is you have to go to the refrigeration tables. And of course, you have to know where to look. Now state two should be a superheated state, so I immediately went to the superheated tables. I found the pressure, and then I found that the temperature had to be interpolated, but it wasn't too bad. I came up with an enthalpy of about 295.13 uh, kilojoules per kilogram, but I forgot to write down my units. And that was by interpolation. So there's the enthalpy in state two. So let's add it in over here, 295.13 kilojoules per kilogram. i move my line down just a little bit. There we go. Now, the pressure in state two and state three are the same because you can think of the evaporator, or I'm sorry, you can think of the condenser and the evaporator as just being open pipes. They're just heat exchangers. And so there's, while in the real world there is pressure drop as the, the refrigerant flows through them, it's not as large as the pressure change due to the compressor and the uh, throttling valve. So the pressure in state three is about equal to the pressure in state two, or in other words, 1,200 kilopascals. So since I know for state three that the pressure in state two equals the pressure in state three, and of course I was given the temperature in state three of 42 degrees Celsius, well, I can look up the enthalpy. So when I looked up the enthalpy in state three, uh, it should come out most likely as a saturated liquid because anytime you have a condenser and that condenser doesn't condense out any of the refrigerant and leaves it in the gas phase, that represents less cooling capacity because what mainly causes the cooling is this expansion, this, this pressure expansion. Some of the liquid will boil off. Okay? When that happens, you want to make sure you have all liquid because whatever liquid does not boil off is liquid that is available for cooling. So you want as much liquid as possible. And it's fairly easy mechanically to make sure that the only thing that comes out of the condenser is liquid refrigerant. So that's, that's very common. So I would expect that state three would be the enthalpy of a saturated liquid at, and we have to decide, will it be at the pressure given or the temperature? Well, they should be the same. It should be a, a pair. So uh, if I look up uh, 1,200 kilopascals and 42 degrees. I don't remember what I found. It's probably worth going to that page. Let me give you a page number in a moment. We're in the metric appendices and we need R134A. So if I go and look up uh, 1,200 kilopascals in the pressure table, page 928 for R134A, it looks like the temperature is given as 46.29. Now I know that the temperature I have is actually below that, right? So the temperature I've actually got for state three is 42 instead of 46 point something. So that means it's actually a subcooled liquid. So what I really need to do is take the temperature and look up the enthalpy at T3 because you see the the enthalpy will be more sensitive to the temperature than it is to the pressure. So what I really need to do is go over to the temperature table, and I've already done that. I'll let you do that. 
I must have had to interpolate it. Well, maybe not. I guess I should look it up. Uh, I may have had to interpolate it because I don't remember them having. You know what? I think the refrigerant tables do go in steps of two degrees, even numbers. I think. Let's find out. So the pressure table for R134A temperature table. Here we go. Yes, it does. Page 927. Uh, 42 degrees is a temperature that is listed. Okay, so I don't have to interpolate. Or I didn't have to interpolate. When I did this, then I found the enthalpy would be 111.26. And understand, this is just the enthalpy of saturated liquid. Of course, it's kilojoules per kilogram. So let's see. There's the enthalpy in state 3. Let's add it to our table. 111.26 kilojoules per kilogram. Now, if you remember throttling valves when we analyze them, there's no work or heat interactions here. Even though the temperature drops when you move from state 3 to state 4, that's because of the boiling process, right? So the, the amount of energy in the fluid does not change. Some of the, 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 the uh, thermal energy becomes flow energy on this side. And so the enthalpy, though, it turns out, remains exactly the same. So for state 4, for example, just looking ahead, the enthalpy in state 4 is equal to the enthalpy in state 3 because it's just a throttling valve. So I can go ahead and write 111.26 as the enthalpy for state 4 uh, as well. All right, now the, the rate at which thermal energy is removed on the uh, top, on the uh, uh, condenser, we know is 8.36 kilowatts. And notice that, uh, let's see, we've got two, three, yeah. So I should be able to figure out how fast the, refri or the refrigerant is flowing. It didn't, notice they didn't tell me the rate at which the refrigerant is flowing. And so essentially what I'm doing is I'm looking at the uh, condenser and saying, well, I've, I've got a, a refrigerant flow going like this. And I essentially have a cooling water flow going like this then it's just a heat exchanger and heat is flowing at this rate, Q dot H, that I already know. Because I already know what's going on with the water. The cooling water, I know the rate at which it's absorbing energy. So that must be the rate at which the refrigerant is giving off energy. And so I can actually write an energy balance around this pretty easily. But really, I guess what I'm doing is about this part since I already know Q dot H, then considering an energy balance around the refrigerant, where this, of course, is what state two, and this is state three, uh, it would look something like this. Q dot H equals the mass flow rate. Now, this is the mass flow rate of the refrigerant, not of the cooling water, multiplied by the enthalpy change across the uh, heat exchanger, across this condenser. Now, when you deal with enthalpies, you don't have to worry about the details of the phase because over here, remember I was pointing out that this is a sensible energy change and that's how I represented this uh, power flow. But um, this can accommodate both a latent and sensible change because look, H3 is a liquid thing, right? Whereas H2 is superheated, so the details of the, or the accounting for the phase change energy and the temperature changes, it's all right here. We don't have to worry about those details so much. So if I rearrange this, I can find the mass flow rate of the refrigerant, and it, of course, would be Q dot H divided by H2 minus H3. So plugging all of that in, uh, the 8.36 uh, kilojoules per second divided by H2 295.13 less H3, 111.26, both of these being uh, kilojoules per kilogram, gives us a mass flow rate of refrigerant in kilograms per second. It comes out to about 0 0.0455 kilograms per second. Okay. So we've almost finished uh, solving this problem. You might look at it and say, well, what about the temperature and pressure at state 4? I don't really care. What I care most about is the enthalpy in that state. So um, I do know that, of course, we'll end up with 
a, a saturated mixture here. And I think one of the questions, yeah, is how much of it is in the vapor phase because whatever, you really, you want the, the uh, quality in state four to be as low as possible because you want to have as much liquid as possible to absorb more heat. But that is one of the questions, so we'll, we'll work on that as well. But why don't we start with state one? Because notice we don't have the enthalpy yet for state one. So I'll just start over at the top again here. And we're working on state one. For that, we know that the pressure in state one and the temperature in state one are both known. 60 kilopascals, uh, negative 34 degrees Celsius. That's better. And since I know both of those pieces of information, I should be able to simply look up the enthalpy in state one. Now, if you think about what state one is, well, state one is coming out of the evaporator. So it should be in equilibrium with the liquid that comes in. So uh, what that really means is that the, the, the stuff that comes out here would be a saturated vapor. So it should be on the saturation line. The quality should be equal to uh, one. And so I just need the enthalpy in state one of saturated vapor. Now let me double check and make sure that's what I use. I'm pretty sure I did. But I need to check and make sure that that's how it comes out. Because if you think about it, they've given us the pressure and temperature for the state. So I may have to, uh, it may not be exactly saturated vapor. Let's find out. So R134A, state one, 60 kilopascals, negative 34. So if I look at the saturated temperature table, page 926, I think will do and negative 34 degrees, it looks like we need a pressure of 69.56 kilopascals. Now our actual pressure is lower than that, which means that uh, it would be slightly superheated because we don't have quite enough pressure to get us to the saturation or saturated vapor state. Uh, we've got less pressure, so let me go over to the superheated tables uh, let's see, they have 0.06 megapascals, which would be 60 kilopascals, on page 929. And at a temperature of negative 34 degrees, well, they don't have it, they've got 30 and 40. So I'll have to interpolate to come out with the enthalpy. So I've already done that, and when I interpolated, I found uh, this won't work, right, because the pressure is too low for it to actually be. Uh, saturated vapor. So I had to go to the superheated tables, interpolate, and I got 230.05 kilojoules per kilogram. That finishes off all of the enthalpies, which are probably the most important numbers to find in order to solve the problem. Okay, so now that we've got all of that, they did ask us for the quality in state four. I know the enthalpy in state four, and state four should have the same pressure as state one. Remember, this is the low pressure side. I'm using the assumption again that this is just an open pipe heat exchanger, essentially. So the pressure drop is negligible. Therefore, the pressure in state four is equal to the pressure in state one, 60 kilopascals. And now I've got two pieces of information. So I should be able to find out anything I want to know. For example, now if we move on to state four and ask the question about the quality in state four, the pressure, 60 kilopascals. The enthalpy is the other thing I know, 111.26 kilojoules per kilogram. Can't make a very good uh, early breath. There we go. So if I want to get the quality in state four, the way I would have to calculate it would be at 60 kilopascals first. So I need to go to the saturation tables and look up 60 kilopascals. Then whatever I find there, what I'm going to need is the enthalpy in state four minus the enthalpy of the saturated liquid, which of course is at 60 kilopascals, divided by HFG, the difference between the saturated liquid and vapor at 60 kilopascals. See? So these are what I have to fill in. Now, of course, H4 is easy. That's 
Looking up HF at 60 kilopascals, you'll find that that is 3.841. Now all of these are kilojoules per kilogram, so I won't bother writing that. HFG at 60 kilopascals is 223.95. All the units end up canceling. Uh, let's see. Where do I want to put this? I probably should add on to my table and just have a quality column. So for state four, once you run these numbers, the quality in state four comes out to about 0 0.4797. So almost half of the refrigerant has boiled off and is in the vapor phase in state four. Okay, so that takes care of the first question. The next question is, what's the heat transfer rate into this? In other words, how quickly are we pumping heat out of the area where we want to pump it out of. Well, let's find out. So Q dot L would be the mass flow rate of the refrigerant multiplied by the enthalpy change across the evaporator. Okay? That's just an energy balance around the evaporator. Okay? I guess I should have Q dot L outside of that, but hopefully you see what I'm saying. So that's where this equation comes from. It's just an energy balance. And now you see why I had to get the refrigerant flow earlier on. 0 0.0455 kilograms per second multiplied by, let's see, H1 to 30.05 less H4, 111.26 kilojoules per kilogram. Gives me the... Uh, I guess I'll put a box around this because that's one of the answers they wanted. So what does it give me for Q dot L? I already calculated that. It comes out to about 5.405 kilowatts. And that's one of the things they wanted. So let's put a box around that to make it clear. So that takes care of Q dot L. The coefficient of performance well, the coefficient of performance of the refrigeration system uh, can be calculated in several different ways. We've actually got Q dot H and Q dot L. So the coefficient of performance, uh, you could use Q dot H and Q dot L. I don't want to, and the reason is because we've also got this uh, Q dot N. So I want to be careful about that because um, Let's see. Let's, let's just go this way. Q dot L over power N. Now this, this, this is something that's required. This is something that drives the system. So you can make an argument for saying that this is a required input, but you get this along the way. And so you should add them together. So what I'm really going to do is this. It's not that this comes in and really does anything useful. It's just that it's an input to the system. It's something that happens. It's energy that flows in. And what I really want to know is what's the heat pumping rate for what comes in, if you will. Okay. Now, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm doing this backwards. I meant to subtract that off. Let's see, is that what I'm trying to do? Yes. Yeah, because, because think about where this is going to go. So this heat transfer that comes in is going to change the enthalpy from state one to state two. Basically, all of this heat is going to come into the refrigerant, right? So the work that flows in, that I actually have to pay for, that's going to come in and it's going to, um, it's going to cause a change in the enthalpy of the gas. Let me. Let me write down a little bit more, and you'll see why I'm playing with this and why I'm considering it. Because uh, really, I'm, you could say this is what I'm doing. And let me, let me show you. If I do it on a per unit mass basis, then that's really how the coefficient of performance is defined. But I can't calculate 
the work input just by the enthalpy change. Normally what I would do at this point is say, okay, no big deal. The specific work input is just H2 uh, minus H1. But the difference between H2 and H1 right here is in part due to this Q dot coming in. Does that make sense? So what I was trying to get at is that's why I have to subtract off QN. Now this is not this flow, it's not this flow, it's this flow. And so I actually have to calculate it. I don't, I don't know it yet, right? What I really have to do is say, well, it's the power that flows in divided by the mass flow rate of the refrigerant. Why is it the mass flow rate of the refrigerant? It's because this heat ends up in the refrigerant. So if I know, you know, one uh, kilogram of mass goes by, well, how much of this goes in? That's what this will give me, see? Now, QL is a lot easier because QL is all responsible for the enthalpy change from state uh, four to state one. So state uh, one has more enthalpy in it, so I'll say H1 minus H4, and that's my energy balance for QL. But really what I've had to do is write an energy balance around the compressor in order to come up with this, which represents just the specific work input piece. Hope that makes some sense. I was trying to explain it by throwing it in here, but that's confusing because that's really not the definition of the coefficient performance. Okay. So we've got H1, H4, H2, H1. All those are, notice we don't have, we don't need H3. It doesn't appear uh, in the equation. But then Q dot N and M dot, what I'm going to do is plug in 450 watts divided by, well, I've erased the mass flow rate. The mass flow rate was 0 0.0455 kilograms per second of refrigerant. So that's what I would plug in here. I won't show you all those details. I'll just show you the result. So this comes out to, uh, let's see, 2.15. And that is one of the answers they wanted us to find, so I'll put a box around it as well. So there is the coefficient of performance of this refrigerator. Last thing in, uh, last thing we need, Q dot L max. Well, what do we mean when we say the maximum? Well, we mean the limits. What, what would thermodynamics theoretically allow? Well, if we could get a reversible system, something where all the processes were reversible, that would be the best we could ever do. And a reversible refrigerator would have an efficiency of a reverse cargo cycle. So it would be 1 over TH over TL minus 1. And so what we have to do is decide, well, what's the high and the low temperature? Well, remember I said there's some irreversibility here. The refrigerant is at negative 34 degrees. The environment is at negative 30, right? That's just so we can get heat to flow. But heat flow always represents an irreversibility. So the low temperature reservoir is at 30 degrees. So I'm going to write 1 over, let's see, I'll write TH in a second, okay? but I'm going to, I want to write TL first. Negative 30, but I can't just put in negative 30 degrees. I have to add 273 to it to get absolute temperature. Now we'll figure out TH next. What should it be? Well, what are we pumping heat into? Well, we're pumping heat into water at 18 degrees, right? In reality, the refrigerant goes all the way up in state two to 65 degrees, but I, I wish I didn't have to do that, right? Because if the refrigerant's at 65 degrees, flowing heat into water or pushing heat or transferring heat into water at 18 degrees, even when that water comes up to 26 degrees, there's still a temperature difference there and, and therefore an irreversible heat flow. But the high temperature reservoir that I'd really like to flow into would simply be 18 degree water. I mean, after all, I'd like to have as much water as necessary so that the water temperature doesn't change, right? I'd like to have an infinite reservoir, basically, a, a, uh, a thermal energy reservoir in order to pump heat into. But what, I'm, what I have to get by with is cooling water that changes its temperature. Now, of course, I can make the cooling water not change its temperature as much by causing the, the flow rate of the water to increase. That should keep the water from changing temperature quite so much, but this is where we are. So we're, we're asking what's the limit. So plug in all the numbers and you'll find that this is um, 5.0625 or so. That's the maximum coefficient of performance that we could ever hope to achieve if everything was perfectly reversible. 
Now, let's take this one step further. I'd like to find what Q dot L would be. In other words, I'm, I'm paying for a certain amount of work, right? So I'd like to find out what Q dot L would be if I could achieve this. Well, let's see. The idea then is that it would be the coefficient of performance multiplied by Wn. But that would be the coefficient of performance. Of course, we're going to be using the reversible one. I'm trying to get a limit. So this is Q dot L uh, max. Oh, that's what they asked us to find. They didn't ask us to find the coefficient of performance. Okay. So I do have to go through this. But of course, I'm going to use the reverse of coefficient of performance. Uh, I don't want to run off the video. Let's see. So times. Now the, the uh, work flow rate in would be equal to the mass flow rate of the refrigerant multiplied by the enthalpy change across the uh, compressor. The only thing is, I've made a mistake in my solution, so you'll have to calculate this final number. But uh, the, the workflow in is actually H2 minus H1 minus Q dot N over M dot. Okay, and I forgot to put that into my solution when I did this. So this would be, first of all, the mass flow rate of the refrigerant uh, multiplied by uh, H2 minus H1 plus Q dot N over M dot. Okay. It seems wrong. Let me make sure I haven't made a mistake. Yeah, I have made a mistake. I said plus, it should be minus. There. That's better. And we can simplify this just a bit. Let's not forget this is Q dot L. I can simplify this just a bit. I'll plug in the numbers I know, 5.0625. Notice it would cancel there. So you just have um, H2 minus H1 times M dot. So the mass flow rate, I don't know if I still have it written here anywhere. I'll have to reference my sheet for that. Mass flow rate is uh, 0 0.0455 kilograms per second. And that would be multiplied by the enthalpy change, H2 minus H1. So 295.13 less H1 to 30.05, and these are both kilojoules per kilogram. Sorry if that's off the video. I'll have to move down a little bit because I'd multiply M dot by this term, and that would mean that we're done multiplying that, so we just have to subtract Q dot N, which is, by the way, 450 uh, watts. Now, you notice we've got a problem here because we've got kilojoules per second, and here we have, which are kilowatts, and here we have watts. So what I really need to do is write uh, 0 0.45 kilowatts. And of course, all this gets multiplied by the reversible coefficient of performance. Now, I, like I said, I don't know what number that will come out to be because I forgot to do this part in my solution. So I'll have to update my solution and rescan it.